Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the second session of the Emergency Management in Hospitals and Healthcare Speaker Series with Atlanta Acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tecoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that the territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event and our participants may be joining from various locations, I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Misha Richard, who will also be providing us with an introduction to today's topic, <clears throat> along with moderating the Q&A and the discussion at the end. Misha Richard is the current emergency preparedness lead for the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. In this role, she acts as a subject matter expert assisting with the development and maintenance of emergency management governance, training materials, and exercises. Misha also volunteers as an editor for the Canadian Journal of Emergency Management and is happy to be a collaborator and facilitator for the CFAL York series. She holds a Master of Disaster and Emergency Management degree from York University and bachelor's degrees from Western University and Brandon University in the focus areas of political science and disaster studies. Misha, thank you very much for moderating today's session. The floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I certainly don't want to steal too much time from Amanda as our presenter, who I will give you a formal introduction a little bit later on. But as Francesco said, it will give a bit of a quick dive into the topic today. So give me one moment and I will share my screen. Um, I do want to comment that our chat is open. This is open for general dialogue and communication between all the different participants. If there's any relevant resources or links, we'll provide that information into the chat. However, I strongly encourage you that if you have actual questions related to the topic and targeted to the presenters, to put those in the Q&A so that we can properly moderate those questions as they come in. Sometimes they get lost when they're in the chat, which is available for kind of open dialogue and discussion. So let me get my screen up for you. And then we'll jump in. Okay, so hopefully folks can see my screen. And I'll move along with uh, a bit of an introduction. So I'm just going to start off by quickly explaining where I sit, um, because Amanda and myself have very different environments in which we work. Talking about Accreditation Canada standards, there's some updates there. What is the code green, which is actually the topic of today's presentation? What is a code green for myself, where I'm sitting, and a very brief overview of what we consider to be kind of a rapid onset code green, so code green stat. So quick intro to where I am. Um, as Francesco mentioned, I sit up in Thunder Bay at our Regional Health Sciences Center. It's a 375 bed acute care facility and academic health sciences center. It's the only tertiary health care provider for a region that's the size of France. We provide comprehensive care to about a quarter of a million people. We've got 3,400 staff. We average about 1,500 births a year, 13,000 surgeries. These are just some numbers to throw out there as far as a little bit of a context to kind of think about um, some of the different presenters that we'll have throughout this series and how varied our different healthcare um, organizations are. And one last stat is we had approximately 90,000 emergency department visits last year. So I want to quickly mention Accreditation Canada standards. So the topic of Accreditation Canada standards is something that we might pursue as a future topic all on its own. But for those of you that aren't actually from a healthcare setting, um, hospitals in Canada do their best to adhere to these accreditation standards that cover a variety, wide variety of topics and considerations. And recently they released documentation that's specific to emergency management um, in healthcare settings. 
And so the key reference here for anybody that's doing my sort of job, but to give everybody else in attendance a quick um, uh, snapshot of what some of these standards relate to and relating to today's topic of evacuations is that we essentially are supposed to have policies and procedures in place um, and that we're regularly checking and reviewing those policies. But there's also a number of other references within the document. Some of these I would say are uh, again, kind of secondary. So part of it is that we're providing information to people about the emergencies and disasters that we might be at risk for. So for example, if we have to evacuate, are we communicating some of that information in advance to um, guests and our facilities and our patients? And also that we plan for things like emergency transportation if we have to move patients or equipment during an emergency. So these are a few, it's just to give a snapshot of what we're trying to work with. And on that note, giving a bit of a snapshot as far as the quick history of emergency codes. So you've heard me mention code green, you know that the topic today is evacuation. So hopefully everybody has put that concept together for those of you that aren't actually from healthcare settings, that we do have emergency color codes in our hospital system. So Ontario focused, yes, in 1993, here we adopted um, these codes. And today, again, discussing code green. The goal was to reduce the chance of human error and eliminate confusion among hospital staff during an emergency. So by giving a shout out over an overhead paging system or blasting out through mass notification, if you hear code green stat, staff should understand what that means and respond accordingly. The codes were then also endorsed Canada-wide by the Canadian Hospital Association um, in the same year. So just to kind of, again, we have accreditation standards that we're working with that give us some specifics that touch on evacuation. And as far as our code policies and having some sort of standardized process um, so that staff kind of get this, this general baseline foundational understanding of um, the key emergencies that we might face, we do have the hospital emergency color code system. So why are we doing all of this? I'm giving a clip, quick snapshot, not to scare anybody too much, but obviously there's a bunch of different triggers uh, that could lead to hospital evacuation. And these are just headlines that were pulled um, from the news just recently um, from all over the place. So just to, to capture some of that for consideration. Touching on what we have where I am. So again, speaking to the variation between all of our different facilities, and you're going to hear Amanda talk soon about what this process was like at her facility. So we do have kind of a staged approach. Um, I'm not going to say that the way we're doing things is the absolute best way. This is just a way that it works for us. And so again, in this presentation later, and perhaps with other speakers down the road, you might hear some variation. But so we do precautionary. So essentially when you get warning about a threatening event um, and you're getting kind of that advisement from a partner agency, we plan to move them and this is coordinated through our hospital command center or as some others might refer to it, your emergency operations center. Something that's a precautionary will require a senior leader approval within our organization. A stat. So as kind of that, that power word would suggest is this is something that's rapid. So you're either gonna move horizontally in the hospital or you're gonna move vertically in the hospital. Um, it's when you don't have time, just needs to get done, can be activated by any worker in our facility. If we're gonna go larger than just one particular department or unit, we consider it to be a partial or a full building evacuation. And we wanna be as planned as possible with something like this. So we list a few of these other considerations and also for your general awareness. So patient um, dispositions tracked, pertinent information, medication accompanies the pa uh, patients when they evacuate. Horizontal or vertical evacuation might lead to a full building. And we have different staging areas that we set up that are part of this process. So again, really high level overview of how we have a bit of a staged approach here and how we target evacuation. We also have department sub plans. I'm not expecting anybody to read this in the fine print. This is just to kind of give you again, a um, quick overview of the fact that we have a template. Um, we have them so that they're consistent with our overarching evacuation policies. They get reviewed annually, but they're including that department specific information. So mentioned patients with medication before, thinking about those steps, but also if you're the pharmacy, you're going to have different steps than if you're a patient facing unit um, that's actually thinking of moving patients in the moment. And then our directors and managers here are responsible for ensuring that these plans are up to date and that workers know what their responsibilities are. 
And then we also highlight specifically some key instructions um, that are different for any of those clinical departments. So if they have to evacuate, like I said, horizontally, or if they need to evacuate vertically. Um, we also spell out who our responders are. So I only have a couple more slides and then I'll wrap up. Um, so again, other facilities might capture some of these um, teams. So for us, we have our code green stat ends up being a representative from each of our patient care areas. We have somebody from our housekeeping, somebody from our portering, security, respiratory therapist, and then depending on the time of day, we'll have one of our members of leadership or our administrative coordinator after hours. And this is the initial team. So I'll give you a quick slide about an occurrence that we had as far as a code green staff. So we had our sprinkler system triggered during routine cleaning. And um, in speaking with some other colleagues in healthcare, this has happened to others. <laughs> so we figured I'd bring up this example. So what ended up happening was um, the, the sprinkler ended up being struck during cleaning. It ended up activating the sprinkler system, which is a part of our fire alarm system, which triggers a code red, which is a fire. So there is no fire in the hospital at this point in time. It's just the sprinkler system, which is creating this massive deluge. So it required us to evacuate three clinical units that flooded because of this. I'll also comment that it's not bright, clear water. The, the um, break in this was discolored. So there was concerns about you know, what um, is actually impacted here. It's flooding into areas where there's electronics, not just the patient care consideration, but kind of that cascading effect. And so what we took away from this instance was, Nobody actually called a stat. All of this very well would have um, classified as something that requires that rapid kind of immediate response where you need support. Um, but after dialogue with our leadership, they did actually call this code green. Regardless of the delay in having any sort of overhead announcement to uh, the rest of our hospital that we had this sort of stat-like situation, thankfully all of the patients from those areas were relocated in less than an hour and we were able to clear this code entirely. And then we had remediation right away starting on this and we did have to get external support in order to remediate. But in general, within a week, we had everybody back in those units. So just to give you a quick snapshot of a situation where you had to do kind of a rapid evacuation that we refer to as a code green stat at our facility. Um, opportunities for improvement. As I said, there was a bit of confusion around who gets to call a code green stat. So we did refresher training, really trying to empower staff that they can call it in the moment. Sprinkler heads were prone to damage. So we installed cages in our high risk areas to prevent this from happening again. And we also had a lack of hot wash debriefs. So it's one thing to have an overarching formal debrief with your leadership talking about any one of these emergency responses, but we realized that we needed to provide an opportunity for teams at the site who had full out experienced this um, to debrief. And when we went through a comprehensive policy review last summer, we actually embedded a new hot wash policy, um, sorry, hot wash debrief process into that policy update. And we created um, debrief videos of teams doing these hot washes, talking about real incidents to be able to share that so that people could understand what we were getting at when we were saying a hot wash debrief. So I'll stop there and open it up just in case if there's a question or two. Again, the, the main show is coming, but just wanted to give that overview of code green evacuation. That's what we're talking about in healthcare, at least from one facility's um, lens. And now that I've talked about a stat, I can talk about a full hospital evacuation by turning the microphone over to our lovely key speaker for this session. So I will introduce um, Amanda Kasmerik uh, right now. She, she's the Director of Quality and Risk at the Led, pardon me, Red Lake Margaret Conchner uh, Memorial Hospital. So during her time in this role, she's been involved with multiple emergencies, including flooding, windstorms, airport closures, forest fires, and of course the pandemic. Prior to joining uh, the hospital, Amanda also worked for eight years as a part of the Aviation, Forest Fire, and Emergency Services branch of the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. 
And during this period, Amanda held various positions within the incident management structure during both national and international incidents. So now I turn it over to you, Amanda. I'm excited to hear you talk about your experiences. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to share the screen here to talk about that very real <laughs> situation that we face here. Um, this picture right here, you can see is our one road in and one road out of our community. I'm from a very small rural location. Um, I'm in Red Lake, Ontario. It's next to the Manitoba border. And even though we still are in Ontario, we're approximately a 22 hour drive from Toronto and in a completely different time zone. We have about 6,000 residents over 100 kilometers and we can receive 60 to 85,000 additional visitors between mining and tourism throughout the year. We also feature regular visitors from Northern Indigenous communities such as Pecantucum, Poplar Hill, Deer Lake and Sandy Lake. We staff at all times one land ambulance here and another 70 kilometers away Sorry about that, <laughs> in Ear Falls. Our next closest hospitals are 200 and 300 kilometers away respectively. So for some perspective, I Google, I Google maps it and you can actually travel from sick kids in Toronto to London Health Sciences Center in less distance than it takes us to travel to our next nearest hospital. So a bit more about our hospital. We are an 18 bed facility with a long term care home attached that has 32 beds, but it's under uh, separate management. Our entire leadership team consists of nine individuals, but two are from outside organizations. And of those nine, four sit on our senior leadership team. The community of Red Lake itself also has a history with forest fires. We have what the community calls the big one in 1980 where we immediately lost our road in and out of the community and community members were shipped off to islands to be evacuated via flow plane or the Hercules aircraft from the military. This situation makes our incident management team interesting because even if it blows out to a full team structure, it's still multiple roles under one individual. To speak to the fire that we experienced, the fire started approximately five o'clock on August 10th, 2020. I was the administrator on call for the hospital at that point. And just for some perspective, I was out walking my dog here when I turned towards Matson and saw a large plume of fire. I then drove out to Matson to assess the danger because I couldn't see where the fire location was and if there was any threat to the hospital. After assessing the situation, I phoned our CNE or chief nursing executive who had also seen the smoke and reported to our hospital, which is located here. I told her I thought it was a good idea to prepare for evacuation at that time and then tried to drive back to the hospital along this road. The fire had already overtaken the road at that point and no matter what I said to the people at the roadblock, they would not let me through. So I tried phoning the municipality at that point to open up the road to let me go through so I could go back to the hospital and I received no answer. So at that point, I phoned my old boss from the fire management world, who was actually in a helicopter above the fire at the time and said I needed a situation report and a way through. He told me he would get me through. They were considering evacuation, so I should probably prepare and to give him a second. Uh, upon, upon hanging up from that phone call, I launched my entire incident management team, which I think was five individuals in the, in the community at the time because it was vacation season, and told them to get to the hospital. We were going into emergency mode and uh, prepping for evacuation. My old boss then had phoned back and stated he had me a way through, but they were going to call it the entire community was being evacuated at the same time as the hospital. And they were going to be evacuated via road. I was escorted to the other side, and you can see a picture. I did not take one in the time. My priority was to get back to the hospital. But you can see what the sides of the roads look like at that point when I was driving from Matson to Red Lake. 
When I arrived, a large part of my job was calling other hospitals, transportation companies. I coordinated with our long-term care home because they only had one leader on site when we phoned and they were expecting assistance from outside resources, but all hands were on deck on the community situation. I phoned all the key numbers the healthcare world are told to phone in case of any emergencies. I phoned our insurance company and I gave key directions to staff members as they came up to me once their tasks were finished. At this point, I was considered the incident manager for the incident. The reason for the evacuation and the large concerns for the community was not only is this the only way in and out of the community and it's a stretch of road about 100 kilometers, you can see our power lines run across here. We have a natural gas that also runs along this road and there's two large holding tanks right at this juncture. So they immediately had concerns about what would happen if the fire hit that gas reserve. We also were under threat of losing any telecoms, so any ability to communicate for the hospital itself as well as anybody else in the community. The community evacuation was called at approximately 8.30 and our last patient was evacuated out at four in the morning, at which point staff slept in the hospital. I went to bed around 2 a.m. after the last patient transfer was secured and then woke up at 6 a.m. to start again. If you're looking at it from an IMS structure perspective, I sat in the role of the incident manager safety officer. What that meant for me was coordinating the incident, but also determining our go, no go points when we would evacuate ourselves, regardless of whatever information we were getting. In terms of operations, our CNE, Chief Nursing Executive, grabbed the patient cardex, which is our version of a summary of who's on the floor and their medical needs, their most immediate medical needs. And she began triaging with Orange, our air ambulance, in order to get the most complex patients out first. We also determined which could be released with family for a short-term basis, or at least to get them to the next hospital. And other departments ensure we're critically upstaffed and any supplies we might need for the next 48 hours. Logistics, we brought in two food and nutrition staff who baked lunches for our patients and staff for the next 48 hours, so we knew we had food. The pharmacy gathered the medications for each patient for the next 24 to 48 and put them in packages to send with patients to sort out any difficulties getting prescriptions on the other end so we could make sure they could still receive their medications. Our transportation uh, was largely fixed wings and family, but the lodge transported their 32 long-term care residents with a coach bus, all except one, and the last one had an ambulance transfer and the ambulance came from Conora, a three hour drive away. So once we were done and had enough staff to locate, including our maintenance department, department went down and started loading patients and carrying them onto the coach bus to send down the road. Our planning largely focused on staffing. Our immediate thoughts were to halt the staff that we had in place from leaving and calling our next shift immediately and trying to get them in. In some cases, because most people had received word that the whole community was evacuating, we did lose some staff from our next shift. So then we just did random call outs to try to ensure we had skeleton staffing until we knew what our plan was as an actual hospital. We located staff also for safety reasons, but it ended up holding a secondary purpose for us because we had a location map of staff. So we knew who was closest to us and who we could call back the fastest if we needed to. We notified all the families of our patients and told them where their loved ones were being sent and what the situation was. And we determined the minimum amount of staff across the whole hospital that we needed to maintain in order to function. This was at a time before ED closures were all over the media. So the idea of a hospital closing was just unheard of at this point. But we also knew based on losing our heating, we could function at best as a first aid station for all the firefighters and community members out dealing with the incident on the ground. My first task on waking up was getting information and getting us around the right tables. 
Everyone I phoned said they would let us know when they had updates, but that was not good enough to keep our staff on site. We needed real information. So based on my previous experience, I knew that the fire management base would be holding twice daily briefings and I bypassed community partners and phoned them directly and said I wanted a seat at the table or we would leave. I, this proved to be the difference between us being able to stay and operate as a first day station versus closing up doors and leaving the community. It allowed us to be heard in a way that just receiving phone calls with updates didn't. It gave us real-time information, including any potential threats. And it gave us priority standing for our asks as a hospital for the resources and stuff that we needed. It also allowed staff to feel safe enough that we could remain in place. And it allowed us to build an accurate go-no-go -no -go plan that involved whether we had the road out, whether we had to take a boat to the airport and what that looked like for the remaining staff and what a field hospital at the airport could look like while we were waiting for a flight out. In that time, we also, so we started packing for each of those scenarios so we could just grab bags and leave. We also were able to ask for radios so that we knew if we lost our telecoms, we could at least hear the fire situation and do any emergency communication that was necessary. After day four, the constant threat we were under, that we could lose our road every day, that it was still coming, the fire itself came within two kilometers of town. We started planning our return to work and what that would look like, our return to normal. When we talked on the briefings, we talked about our service to the community. There was no way we could actually consider ourselves a hospital until we had our natural gas back because that provided our hot water. We were operating with no hot water, no ability to do any infection control. And we have to keep in mind, this was at the height of the pandemic where we evacuated as well. So infection control was key. We also started locating our patients. Some of our patients had been discharged in this time because they had gotten better. So we had to track down and figure out our repatriation plan for all the patients coming back our way and how we could do it in a way that supported everyone. And we also looked at what departments we would need to call back first. And those included our laundry and our housekeeping. We were using supplies so that we could stay there 24 seven, including sleeping in beds. And we needed to ensure infection control processes, our hot water, everything was clean and ready to receive our patients again. We were in constant contact with the OPP at roadblocks. We had direct lines so that we could feed staff in and out as we rotated out. And that location map we had done allowed us to, to determine which staff to call back first. Current staff were released so that they could go out and be with their families because a lot of them had been separated from everything they love at this time, not knowing what would if they were okay and the other ones wondering if their loved ones were okay at the hospital this time as well. So that was a big unexpected, I think, for us or for me because I had been around the fire world for eight years from boots on the ground to eyes in the sky. So... I felt very comfortable with the information I was getting, but so I regret that I did not pay enough attention to the psychological safety of my staff because I was like, does anybody need a break? And someone said, yes, I have to say I was surprised at first because I didn't realize the sheer toll of living on the constant threat of evacuation was taking on staff. What went really well for us is we do at our site a hazard assessment of what we think could come our way in the likelihood of that, of all emergency scenarios, technological, weather related and otherwise. So we knew we, wildfires were a very real reality for us and we had held the tabletop exercise with our community partners in the spring before this event happened. It gave us one real key piece of information that I think is important for anybody on this call to hear that's in the healthcare world. If you have a community emergency, your community resources are dedicated to that. They are not there to help you or can guarantee they can help you in that moment. They might love to, but they won't have those resources necessarily. So that let us take back our plan and figure out 
are what ifs. What if we can't call the police to help us with security? What if we can't call the fire department to build us an extra, extra brigade around the building? And then we have to figure out those things on our own. So that's something to keep in mind if you're dealing with one sector and emergency preparedness. We also, just luckily enough, like I said, my experience was in wildfire. So I had the knowledge of what I could ask for, resources, who I could talk to, and how to get us the right information and around the right tables. In a lot of cases, you do have someone that's not necessarily holding a role, but might have the best information about that type of scenario. Move them to the key role of liaison. Have them, they might have the contacts already to get you around the table or to ask better questions than you could. Staff check in staff felt really supported. And overall, our evacuation was a success because anytime you can evacuate a whole hospital and everyone's fine, it's a success. It is. <laughs> You're under a lot of strain, so pat yourself on the back, whatever comes out after that. <laughs> and those daily briefings went really well. It's, we had one of our physicians interviewed by the media several times, and they kept cutting her footage because she wasn't concerned enough to make the cut for newsworthy notice. So something to, if you have the right information and can speak calmly, you become very unattractive to the media, we found. <laughs> Also, I have to give a shout out to the family and friends of our patients because our relationship is really good with those family and friends and they started showing up for their loved ones in situations to see if they could take them down the road for us, realizing how many people we would have to figure out in a short amount of time. Definitely a code green stat, as Misha alluded to. <laughs> now, always with any emergency, we go into what could have gone better. There is no way to explain other than say, if it went wrong, it probably did during this scenario. We had everything in place, memorandums of understanding with our bus transportation companies, et cetera. But the first bus we called, which was the coach in town, uh, was parked for so long for, because of the pandemic that it would, actually couldn't start and it was broken. And when we went to call our school bus lines, they had moved them out of the community to use them in another community for the summer because they, they felt there was no need to keep them in town. So we ended up having to transport a coach from three hours away. Once they got back to town from another route, it was on. I was nine months pregnant at the time and I was taking my last admin on call shift before uh, going off on mat leave. Our CEO, who had joined us a year previous, was on her first vacation ever out of town and was 20 hours away. And my phone call went along the lines of, hi, I don't want you to worry. We have things under control, but we're evacuating an entire hospital. <laughs> Needless to say, it was not a call she wanted to receive. <laughs> It was vacation season for community partners we contacted as well as for our staff too. So we didn't have a lot of extra staff on site to begin with. Um, it was right at shift change and during in our shift change, minimum staff comes on and that's a three person only in the building. And timing, uh, no resources that all the numbers that we get in the healthcare world to call in case of an emergency, due to the stat status, no one could have helped us in the time we had. We were on our own in that sense. I mean, we had our air ambulance and they were wonderful, but I mean, additional resources, say the military coming, that was not an option because the situation happened in such a fast amount of time. I also learned and I, just like to pass along here that there's an assumption when it comes to healthcare that everybody that works in healthcare is a superhero that's ready for every emergency because we even have emergency on our doors. But this staff is trained for a very specific emergency. We're not trained for a wildfire coming at us. It doesn't mean we won't react accordingly, but there seemed to be an assumption that we needed as little information as possible because we're, of course, always ready. But we still have humans in the building. And when you're putting them in a situation they're not familiar with, reactions will be much the same as anybody else in those situations. 
So if you look at your plans, if you're not in the healthcare world and it ends something along the lines of, and then we get them to the hospital or it involves the word hospital at any point, contact your hospital and let them know what your plan for them is because they're not able to serve you in the way that your plan says without knowledge. And also on that note, I've found since joining this world that everyone thinks the emergency ends when you get to the hospital, but for the hospital, that's when our emergencies start. So we might need those resources from the community to hang on and assist us in our processes because we can also become overwhelmed quite quickly. And the last piece, I'm sure you'll hear through your emergency preparedness journey or you'll know this already, but recovery is the hardest part of any emergency. If you can take any tabletop you've done and reverse engineer it so that you're doing tabletops just on recovery, I would recommend it. Because there's a sense that like as soon as people are ready for things to be normal, they want to switch flips. So your reports are still due, your staff are suddenly expected to go back to a full-time job, and then you get constant, like, did we have so-and-so for two hours extra on that Thursday, or was it three? Because they're looking for their paycheck right now, and you've had little sleep, you're trying to go back to your regular, and that's the stuff that breaks down your team. So if you can design just a scenario in which you take all the documentation you can, and then someone just comes in and asks you, and you have to go through a whole file box to see if it's anywhere in there. Well, you're tired and you just want that day off that's coming up. <laughs> that's the stuff that's gonna burn out your staff, and that's the stuff that we assume will just go back to normal, but that's the actual part of the emergency that lasts the longest and can be the most tiring and wearing and cause the most burnout because you don't have the benefit of that adrenaline in the moment where you just get to make decisions based on the best information you have. And then often in recovery, as, as much as we know lessons learned make the difference, it's hard to sit and hear with someone with hindsight to tell you all the things that could have been done better, even if it needs to be done when you had little to no information in the moment. So some grace and some practice around hearing that information is also a key part of the recovery process. And when you have those lessons learned, please don't become complacent. We knew that our hazard still was the wildfire. Like even though we felt pretty experienced and pretty, like we knew we could handle a situation when it came, it still remained our hazard. So our team decided to continually practice it on an annual basis because we were worried about complacency. And as much as we like to feel confident that we reacted well after a situation, the next evacuation could come the following summer and be completely different. So, thank you. That was a bit of our experience. There's lots of tangents, of course, I could go on, but um, I will leave it open to questions. So, First, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I mean, you've really covered a lot of key takeaways, I think, for our audience that capture those that are in healthcare settings, as well as those that are from outside of this segment of the discipline um, that are really important for us to essentially absorb. <laughs> and flagging at the very end of this presentation. So I do feel like you've dropped some, some punches in there to everybody that's watching. Is it like, wow, this can happen. Guess what? Our CEO is gone. Guess what? This was my last shift before I was supposed to go on mat. And then highlighting here with this last slide that your hospital did do all of this again the following summer. So at this point, um, I'll quickly review. I know there was a question put in the chat. A couple of them we were able to answer as we go, but someone did put forward kind of a two-pronged question. So did you directly contact the other departments like the Ontario Provincial Police or the Fire Department, or was it through formal channels with your emergency operations center. So we always think of perhaps the direction they're thinking of is there's the liaison or there's different positions. Was it sort of you personally reaching out or was it done as communication between one EOC and another EOC? So 
the EOC for us ran from the municipality for the entire community, but we could not get a seat at the table. They wanted to keep stuff as confidential as possible, I think, because it was a very, they felt a potentially heated situation. So anybody that we reached out to, I had to directly reach out. And that's why I chose to go towards the briefings because I knew they would be sitting on that phone call as well. And I wanted to make sure they were considering us at all times in their evacuation plans, should we have to evacuate the rest of the community because any evacuation you have to keep in mind is voluntary. People will choose to stay behind, even though it's not in their best interest. So there's always kind of a secondary plan sitting there for them as well. I think um, that also perhaps touches on another really good reminder, which I think kind of filtered through a couple of points in your slides about the relationship building. So because of you coming from that segment of um, emergency management and response world, you knew that they were hosting those debriefs, you had some of those contacts, so you were able to kind of do that um, side connection highlights perhaps to the rest of us again how important having those relationships and advance are and kind of knowing who those potential counterparts and point people would be the second piece to this question um, was around kind of the main way of content contacting pardon me others um, in your area during this instance if we're thinking of you know phones being down or some of those other service interruptions so uh, any clarification that you're able to provide as far as how you were actually doing uh, the communication and contact with others? We were fortunate because they truly a weather shift happened and that saved the telecoms. We were fully prepared that we would only have radio contact with the base at some point. Then they also had satellite phones, so we would ask for them at that point, but we didn't ask for them immediately. We operated under the assumption that if our telecoms were lost, our road most likely we would be, and we would be moving to the airport at that point. And that's why I wanted the radio for those key communications, because that was one of our no go. There are go no go plans, and we made that internally because we wanted to feel safe regardless of what the outside expectations of us were. So it was a matter of luck, but we were prepared to have only radio communications at one point. Let me quickly check the chat again. Um, so we do have a question asking what was the role of the Ministry of Health? Um, what was the role of the Ministry of Health's Emergency Operations Center for this event. So essentially the provincial ministry's involvement. We had phone briefings with them and they would make phone calls on our behalf. But uh, from my perspective, that's the role the CEO took after, because we she had immediately decided she was going to hop on a plane, but we had no idea how long the emergency was going to last if by the time she got back home, if there would be a point. So we convinced her to stay and then she took those Ministry of Health phone calls on and just took information from us, but we didn't see any boots on the ground or any resources. I believe there might have been some advocacy if we needed certain things like our natural gas had to be the first thing turned on. I know our community was working with it, but maybe the Ministry of Health helped with pressuring that. As mentioned, it was it happened so fast and no one knew what the next steps were for quite a while that by the time the Ministry of Health would have sent someone up to be boots on the ground, it might have been over. So it was mostly just informational meetings that I participated in, just updating. So I've got to comment again, as, as we said, the last slide was highlighting that you went through it all again the next summer, Amanda, not that anybody on the line envies you for being so well practiced at this now. Um, are there any takeaways that you would like to share between what you learned that first year that you were able to apply or evolve the next summer? The next year, our 
I think everyone learned something. So we were actually put on evacuation notice, but not evacuated as a community. And we pulled the, we acted immediately once we had that information and got our patients out. Because if you remember a picture previously, the road was blocked all the way from, for about a hundred kilometers because they had decided to do wellness checks. So it was taking 10 hours to get like a hundred kilometers down the road for some of these people. So we did not want to be in that mix if we had patients and buses. So we evacuated before the community and the community itself ended up being okay. It was just voluntary evacuations, but we just acted as soon as we, in both cases, we acted as soon as we had the information, but we didn't wait to see if it would escalate the second time because we knew we had an opportunity to take our time to get patients out in a more calm and organized way. Excellent. Um, I also appreciated that as you pulled out all these examples of what could be layered on to making things more challenging in the moment, um, commenting that you're now training on this scenario annually. Um, I feel like you'd probably have to dig deep maybe for some scenario considerations given what you actually went through in real life. Um, but do you have any tips as far as anybody on the call that's trying to pull together training around this? Practice your recovery. <laughs> um, we had our, we had two different scenarios. So you could practice it in multiple ways. You have no notice. Um, your transportation affected is a big one because that's a very surprising thing, I think, for anybody because you think you have options. There was one point during this emergency where my CNE was trying to figure out how many people she could fit in her minivan. And I actually phoned, embarrassingly enough, Trenton Air Base and tried to launch my own Hercules to help. <laughs> because we had 32 bodies and no way of getting them out. And the man on the other line was amazing and explained to me that I was in the kindest way possible, that I was not important enough. But I think what's important to uh, practice in these scenarios is what would you do if that didn't work? So not even about the fire, the information about a fire coming at you, but you have a fire, you're evacuating, this part doesn't work. What's your next step? So it's really about critical thinking and any emergency is what's gonna help you because things will go wrong. Yeah, so that's an excellent, um, an excellent point, which I think highlights that there's only so much that we can spell out in policies and procedures and the rest just has to be critical thinking um, in, those, in those moments. Uh, I do wanna say, I know we still have a few more minutes, so I'll, I'll see if anybody else has some more questions. I think you were just very concise and also personal in, in sharing um, a lot of detail with everyone. But there's a number of thank you messages that are in the chat that they really appreciated being able to hear all the different nuances that were involved with your experience. Um, also request um, as far as the presentation itself, and I know Francesco put it in the chat that this session is recorded, so you will be able to see this after the fact, because I know there was a question saying, we want to get a hold of this because we want to be able to share, share this information, especially um, with similar rural hospital settings. So um, again, the thank you and kudos messages are continuing to come in, but I do also see that Francesco perhaps is maybe ready to take the, uh, the helm again because he's being polite and has his hand up. No, sorry, I wasn't trying to take anything back. I just had actually had a couple of questions for Amanda. Um, so first, you've mentioned a couple of times the importance of like practicing the recovery aspect where most times training and exercise focuses on the actual event itself. Um, are you able to like expand a little bit on like how you've incorporated that idea in in your your exercises and your tabletops since since this happened? Yeah. So one example would be in repatriation of patients. Um, you just get them out to other places as fast as you can, but they're not emergency on the way back. So you're dealing with like competing emergencies across our entire region. We have an air ambulance and they have other priorities. So then you're trying to 
say, okay, how would we locate them? How many could we take back at one time? What would that actually look like? Would we need to have medications ready? Like all of those little details about one and how would you do that on a larger scale? We're testing people in the moment because we all say, keep good, keep good documentation, but give them the scenario, the whole scenario, ask them to take notes, take the paper away from them and then ask them questions and see how good their documentation actually was. Like, did they have that somewhere? Did they think it was important? Could someone have come in on your day off and not phoned you for that answer because of your documentation? So I think anything along those lines that seem like, oh, well, that will just deal with it when the time comes, try those types of scenarios. And like, we had a bit of time to think about it because we were a first aid station, but are more healthcare staff actually the more important people to bring back? Or is it your kitchen staff so they can at least make sure breakfast is ready once you have your patients there? Or maintenance because you have to relight all your pilot lights, but you didn't think about it because that's not your area, right? So all of those little things that keep popping up when you're like, I just want to get this report done. <laughs> um, Francesca, before you jump in, if you have another question, somebody did have a quick question about your actual location then, Amanda, is do you have a morgue at your site? We don't, but in uh, just from an emergency preparedness standpoint, we do have a temporary morgue set up plan should the need arise. And I'll just make one plug because I realize we are a small rural community um, with a small hospital. So I know uh, some people out there are dealing with really large facilities, yourself included, Misha. But I encourage you to reach out to your small hospitals because they, when I look around, they have dealt with an enormous amount of emergencies with very limited resources. And what they apply could be almost thought of as they did this for a department. Like this could be, think of it as one of your departments. So how would we scale that? There's some real lessons learned, even if they're not dealing with the volumes that you have. No, great points. I think there's a lot of inspiration that we can take from your presentation in particular. Um, I know there's certainly takeaways that I already have, and I've been lucky enough to speak to you on the side outside of the session and pick your brain. Um, but Francesco, I think maybe you had uh, another follow-up question for Amanda. I don't see any furthers coming, uh, further questions coming from the chat or the Q&A at this time. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just also to follow up on the, uh, on the second evacuation, you mentioned that it was done during the voluntary phase of evacuation for the community. Does that at all affect your ability to evacuate patients if some of them are not wanting to, to leave the hospital or the community if before it's like a mandatory evacuation? From my understanding, our experience was everybody was willing to go because they knew what could come. And I think part of it is the, the experience we had in 1980, the community is very, on edge when it comes to wildfires. Um, there's not the same ability to just say no in an evacuation from my understanding in, um, in hospitals, because we have to be able to provide medical care. And if we can't do that efficiently, we have to put you where you can receive the medical care you need. It's more a matter of your safety at that point. Okay, great, thank you so much. So Amanda, unless you have any last comments related to your experience that again, we're very grateful for you sharing. I don't see any additional questions that have come through at this time. So I think you checked a lot of boxes. Although wait, now I'm seeing Ali also has his hand up. So perhaps you have a, a question for Amanda before we let her sneak away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. This was really, really interesting um, uh, talk, and uh, I think it provided a lot for 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 many of us to to take on. My my question was re related to the recovery part. This is really interesting for me. Uh, I'm more into that line. Is it possible for you to elaborate more on when you say focus on recovery and importance of that? What are some of the key elements that you were uh, talking about in particular that we can 
uh, go in deeply into it uh, later on. Thank you. I think the biggest pieces for me is how, if you were completely away from your normal operations, what would you need in whatever scenario you have to become completely normal again and continue to drill down on those pieces until everyone's rolling their eyes at you in the room? Like, okay, we would return our patients. Well, what does that look like? We would we would start cooking again. Well, how long till you've had grocery shipment up? How long was your road closed? What could you actually feed patients in the moment? Do you have an emergency menu? Do you have enough bottled water? Should you create more stock on site? How are you actually, and it's nobody's fault, but payroll is a huge piece. So any, any expenses and the documentation around your expenses are key because something will come up. I remember, and this was a big lesson learned for me when I was in the fire, forest fire world, there would be people coming to us afterwards and giving us receipts for things that were lost in the fire, but we would have documentation thanks to this wonderful uh, girl that I learned a lot of lessons from of that piece of equipment safe. So things you don't expect. So I think with a group, like it's, you know, it's not on you to design all of those aspects. Your group will think of things that you don't think of too. You just have to keep drilling down. And if the answer seems too large, keep going. Keep going until you get into those details. It's tiring, but that's what you're going to deal with when you're already tired after your emergency scenario. And you can see that with cybersecurity incidents. They can go on for years. So you need to be practiced and just prepare your staff as best you can for those pieces. Thank you. Do you have an estimate or almost how long would it did it take for you from the time that you finished the emergency, return back to return to normal? Uh, how many days it took, for example, for you? I think we were working on our community relations almost a year afterwards. And it wasn't until our next evacuation when we checked back in with our community partner and they felt like we had done a better job with the one with one particular evacuation of one particular individual. Thank you so, so much. So you're not only having those conversations to find out things that maybe you thought went well but didn't go as well as you thought, but then you're being tested again. And sometimes it can last until the next experience to actually say, did they prove they listened to me? Great, thank you so much. Um, so I think I also don't see any more questions um, and we are close to our end time. So thank you so much, Amanda, for the great presentation and for all of the insights. And thank you, Misha, for that great introduction to today's presentation and for moderating the discussion and facilitating the whole, um, the whole session. Um, and of course, thank you to all of our audience who came and participated and watched. Um, we appreciate the engagement and thank you so much for being here. Um, so just as a quick reminder, this is a monthly series. Um, so we have sessions on the first Wednesday of every month and our next session will be September 6th uh, with Pascal Rodier presenting on, um, as well on their perspective on uh, evacuations from a provincial perspective from the Nova Scotia, um, the Nova Sco Scotia Health Authority. <laughs> um, so uh, for everyone interested in that, please mark that down on your calendar. We will be sending reminders as always, but mark that down on your calendar to, um, to join on September 6th and feel free to keep sharing the event page and the registration within your networks to anyone who might be interested. Um, and as a final reminder, this session is being recorded and will be put up on the event page and on our YouTube channel where there will be a playlist of all of the videos from this series. So thank you again, everyone. Um, and I think that is it for today.